how's your day been? I've been thinking a little bit about Colin and Mary and I've been wondering how strange it must be for Colin because I was thinking Mary's probably the only other child that he's ever met in his whole life. I was thinking how strange that must be and how we sometimes take for granted our friends and the people that we see and the people that we know and while we're all in this strange situation, some of us not being able to see lots of the people that we'd like to, I was thinking I can't imagine what that must be like for Colin to have only known grown-ups for his whole life. Anyway, just thought I'd share that with you. We are moving on to chapter 18 today. So many arguments, haven't we had loads of arguments? Tons going on. Lots of shouting, lots of stamping from Mary, very dramatically. And uh, lots of um, slamming doors. Chapter 18 is called Thou Munnet Waste No Time. Of course, Mary did not waken early the next morning. She slept late because she was tired. And when Martha brought her breakfast, she told her that though Colin was quite quiet, he was ill and feverish, as he always was after he had worn himself out with a fit of crying. Mary ate her breakfast slowly as she listened. He says he wishes thou would please go and see him as soon as thou can, Martha said. It's queer what a fancy has took to thee. That did give it to him last night for sure, didn't I? Nobody else would have dared to do it. A hey, poor lad. He's been spoilt till salt won't save him. Mother says as two worst things as can happen to a child is never to have his own way or always to have it. She doesn't know which is worst. That was in a fine temper thyself too. But he says to me when I went into his room, please ask Miss Mary if she'll please come and talk to me. Think of him saying please. Will you go, Miss? I'll run and see Dickon first, said Mary. No, I'll go and see Colin first and tell him. I know what I'll tell him, with sudden inspiration. She had her hat on when she appeared in Colin's room and for a second he looked disappointed. He was in bed and his face was pitifully white and there were dark circles round his eyes. I'm glad you came, he said. My head aches and I ache all over because I'm so tired. Are you going somewhere? Mary went and leaned against the bed. I won't be long, she said. I'm going to Dickon, but I'll come back. Colin, it's, it's something about the secret garden. His whole face brightened and a little colour came into it. Oh, is it? He cried out. I dreamed about it all night. I heard you say something about grey changing into green. And I dreamed I was standing in a place all filled with trembling little green leaves. And there were birds on nests everywhere and they looked so soft and still. I'll lie and think about it until you come back. In five minutes, Mary was with Dickon in their garden. The fox and the crow were with him again. And this time he'd brought two tame squirrels. I came over on pony this morning, he said. Hey, he is a good little chap, jump is. I brought these two in my pockets. This here one's called Nut and this here one's called Shell. When he said Nut, one squirrel leapt onto his right shoulder and when he said Shell, the other one leaped onto his left shoulder. When they sat down on the grass with Captain curled at their feet, supped solemnly listening on a tree 
a nut and shell nosing about close to them. It seemed to Mary that it would scarcely be bearable to leave such delightfulness. But when she began to tell her story somehow, the look in Dickon's funny face gradually changed her mind. She could say he felt sorrier for Colin than she did. He looked up at the sky and all about him. Just listen to them birds. World seems full of them all whistling and piping, he said. Look at them darting about and arcing at them calling to each other. Come springtime, seems like as if all world's calling. The leaves is uncurling so you can see them and my word, nice smells there is about. Sniffing with his happy turned up nose. And that poor lad, lying shut up and seeing so little that he gets to thinking of things and it sets him screaming. Eh, hey, my, we mung, we mung get him out here. We mung get him watching and listening and sniffing up air and get him just soaked through with sunshine. And we mun't lose no time about it. When he was very much interested, he often spoke quite broad Yorkshire. There were other times he tried to modify his dialect so that Mary could better understand. But she loved his broad Yorkshire and had, in fact, been trying to learn to speak it herself. So she spoke a little now. Aye, that we mun, she said, which meant, yes, indeed, we must. I'll tell thee what us will do first she proceeded, and Dickon grinned, because when the little wench tried to twist her tongue into speaking Yorkshire, it amused him very much. He's took a grady fancy to thee. He wants to see thee, and he wants to see Sutton Captain. When I go back to the house to talk to him, I'll ask him if thou canna come and see him tomorrow morning, and bring thy creatures with thee. And then, in a bit, when there's more leaves out, and happen a bud or two, we'll get him to come out, and that shall push him in his chair, and we'll bring him here and show him everything. When she stopped, she was quite proud of herself. She had never made a long speech in Yorkshire before, and she'd remembered very well. Thou mun talk a bit of Yorkshire like that to Mester Colin. Dickon chuckled. Thou make him laugh, and there's nowt as good for ill folk as laughing is. Mother says she believes half a good hour's laugh every morning would cure a chap as was ready making for typhus fever. I'm going to talk Yorkshire to him this very day, said Mary, chuckling herself. The garden had reached the time when every day and every night it seemed as if magicians were passing through it drawing loveliness out of the earth and the boughs with wands. It was hard to go away and leave it all, particularly as Nut had actually crept onto her dress and Shell had scrambled down the trunk of the apple tree they sat under and stayed there looking at her with inquiring eyes. But she went back to the house and when she sat down close to Colin's bed, he began to sniff as Dickon did though not in such an experienced way. You smell like flowers and fresh things, he cried out quite joyously. What is it you smell of? It's cool and warm and sweet all at the same time. It's wind from moor, said Mary. It comes a sitting on grass under a tree with Dickon and with Captain and Sutton Nut and Shell. It's springtime and out of doors and sunshine has smelled so greatly. She said it as broadly as she could. And you do not know how broadly Yorkshire sounds until you've heard someone speak it. Colin began to laugh. What are you doing? He said. I never heard you talk like that before. How funny it sounds. I'm giving thee a bit of Yorkshire, answered Mary triumphantly. 
I cannot talk as gravely as Dickon and Martha can, but Bessie's I can shape a bit. Doesn't that understand a bit of Yorkshire when tha hears it? And that a Yorkshire lad thy sell, born and bred. Eh, hey, I wonder that not ashamed of thy face. And then she began to laugh too. And they both laughed until they could not stop themselves. And they laughed until the room echoed. And Mrs. Medlock, opening the door to come in, drew back into the corridor and stood listening, amazed. Well, upon my word, she said, speaking rather broad Yorkshire herself, because there was no one to hear her, and she was so astonished. Whoever heard the like? Whoever on earth would have thought it? There was so much talk about. It seemed as if Colin could never hear enough of Dickon and Captain and Soot and Nut and Shell and the pony whose name was Jump. Mary had run round into the wood with Dickon to see Jump. He was a tiny little shaggy moor pony with thick locks hanging over his eyes and with a pretty face and a nuzzling velvet nose. He was rather thin with living on moor grass but he was as tough and wiry as if the muscle in his little legs had been made of steel springs. He had lifted his head and whinnied softly the moment he saw Dickon and he trotted up to him and put his head across his shoulder and then Dickon had talked into his ear and Jump had talked back in odd little whinnies and puffs and snorts. Dickon had made him give Mary his small front hoof and kiss her on her cheek with his velvet muzzle. Does he really understand everything Dickon says? Colin asked. It seems as if he does, answered Mary. Dickon says anything will understand anything if you're friends with it, for sure. But you have to be friends for sure. Colin lay quiet a little while and his strange grey eyes seemed to be staring at the wall. But Mary saw he was thinking. I wish I was friends with things, he said at last. But I'm not. I never had anything to be friends with, and I can't bear people. Can't you bear me? asked Mary. Yes, I can he answered. It's very funny, but I even like you. Ben Weatherstaff said I was like him, said Mary. He said he'd warrant we both got the same nasty tempers. I think you are like him too. We are all three alike, you and I and Ben Weatherstaff. He said we were neither of us much to look at and we were as sour as we looked. But I don't feel as sour as I used to before I knew the Robin and Dickon. Did you feel as if you hated people? Yes, answered Mary, without any affectation. I should have detested you if I'd seen you before I saw the Robin and Dickon. Colin put out his thin hand and touched her. Mary, he said. I wish I hadn't said what I did about sending Dickon away. I hated you when you said he was like an angel and I laughed at you, but, but perhaps he is. Well, it was rather funny to say it, she admitted frankly, because his nose does turn up and he has a big mouth and his clothes have patches all over them and he talks broad Yorkshire, but... But if an angel did come to Yorkshire and live on the moor, if there was a Yorkshire angel, I believe he'd understand the green things and know how to make them grow. And he would know how to talk to the wild creatures as Dickon does. And they'd know he was friends for sure. I shouldn't mind Dickon looking at me, said Colin. I want to see him. I'm glad you said that answered Mary, because, because, quite suddenly it came into her mind that this was the minute to tell him. Colin knew something new was coming. Because what? he cried eagerly. 
Mary was so anxious that she got up from her stool and came to him and caught hold of both of his hands. Can I trust you? I trusted Dickon because birds trusted him. Can I trust you for sure? For sure? She implored. Her face was so solemn that he almost whispered his answer. Yes, yes. Well, Dickon will come to see you tomorrow morning and he'll bring his creatures with him. <gasps> oh, oh, Colin cried out in delight. But that's not all, Mary went on, almost pale with solemn excitement. The rest is better. There is a door into the garden. I found it. It's under the ivy on the wall. If he had been a strong, healthy boy, Colin would probably have shouted, Hooray! Hooray! But he was weak and rather hysterical. His eyes grew bigger and bigger and he gasped for breath. <gasps> oh, Mary! He cried out with a half sob. Shall I see it? Shall I get into it? Shall I live to get into it? And he clutched her hands and dragged her towards him. Of course you'll see it, snapped Mary indignantly. Of course you'll live to get into it. Don't be silly. And she was so unhysterical and natural and childish that she brought him to his senses and he began to laugh at himself. And a few minutes afterwards, she was sitting on her stool again, telling him not what she imagined the secret garden to be like, but what it really was. And Colin's aches and tiredness were forgotten, and he was listening enraptured. It is just what you thought it would be, he said at last. It sounds just as if you'd really seen it. You know I said that when you told me first. Mary hesitated about two minutes and then boldly spoke the truth. I had seen it and I had been in, she said. I found the key and got in weeks ago, but I daren't tell you. I daren't because I was so afraid I couldn't trust you for sure. And that's it. I was expecting more then. I turned my page thinking there would be more, but that's the end of the chapter. I was a little bit wrapped up in the drama then of Mary revealing that she'd known all along about the secret garden. That was quite brave of her. I'm not sure she had to tell Colin the truth, but she chose to because she trusts him now. So she must think he's a real genuine friend. So Dickon is going to visit Colin and they seem to be making a plan to take him to the secret garden, don't they? How wonderful. Apologies for some of that Yorkshire. I find it very hard to read and a little bit harder still now Mary's getting in on the Yorkshire. It's hard sometimes to tell who's speaking and who's saying what. So thank you for your patience and bearing with me. I'll see you tomorrow for the next chapter.